considered a privilege. You know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to borrow a phrase, maybe paraphrase. Only God, through His Holy Spirit, can reveal Himself to us. So let's direct our hearts to the Lord. Lord, we thank You for Your great faithfulness to pursue us. That Your desire is to reveal Yourself to us. Lord, open our hearts. Open the ears, Lord, that we might hear Your words. Thank You for Your servant, our brother. Just anoint His words and whatever is not of You, may it just go away. That Your heart would be revealed to us. We thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, brother. brother. Okay. All right, well, good evening. Uh, Considering the background here, I'm compelled to a little explanation of how we went from Elijah to Moses. (laughs) So, So we've been looking at a phrase that's found in both the Old and New Testament, the spirit and power of Elijah. And what I've suggested is that when we enter into Christ's redemptive work, we are given a new standing before Almighty God. And as we begin to partake of all the marvels and wonders of his redemptive work. We begin to enter in to this spirit and power of Elijah, which is a healing power. And we enter in by faith. And faith has always confounded me. I think for this reason, I had for a long time an understanding that I had nothing to do with my redemption but my sanctification, entering into what God has for for me by faith. The faith part's on me, which is crazy. (laughs) My natural heart has absolutely no ability to trust God for anything. Actually, the perfecting of faith is part of the wonder of his redemptive work. And so we look this morning at how the Lord Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is actually our servant. And his service is perfecting the faith that he has placed in us through his ministry. In the climax, actually, of the book of Hebrews, we are presented with what the Holy Spirit calls a cloud of witnesses. And these cloud, this cloud of witnesses testify to the person and work of the Lord Jesus as the author and perfecter of their faith. And so out of that cloud, I have picked Moses. In other words, I've called Moses to the witness stand (laughs) to testify tonight of the person and work of the Lord Jesus who was the author and perfecter of his faith. So that's how we went from Elijah to Moses. (laughs) Okay, so... The reason I selected Moses is because the scripture gives us the whole full spectrum. The author and perfecter of faith in Moses. And he used as his instrument to begin faith in Moses, he used his parents. And we read that in Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. 
It actually probably goes back even further than that. Uh, Moses' parents were Jochebed and Amram. And their names, I think Jochebed means God's glory. And Amram means exalted people. So they named Moses' grandparents, named their children in ways that glorify the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they had been enslaved for probably 250 years. And they named their child exalted people. That's the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it goes way back. Actually back to Abraham probably. But that's the author of Moses' faith. And then we read about Moses' faith. The two examples the Holy Spirit gives us demonstrate the perfecting work of the Lord Jesus in Moses' life, uh, list his two exits from Egypt. His first exit from Egypt is given to us in 11.24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt. That was his first exit. He went back to Egypt 40 years later, and the Holy Spirit lists his second exit from Egypt as an example of the perfecting of faith that the Lord Jesus built into him. And that's in verse 28. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that he destroyed the first so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians when they attempted it were drowned. So those are the two examples the Holy Spirit selects out of the life of Moses, as it's given to us in the book of Exodus, that highlight the person and work of the Lord Jesus in the heart of Moses. So as we look into the life of Moses, what I'd like to do is not look at Exodus, but rather my favorite summary of the life of Moses is found in the book of Acts. And it was Stephen's defense uh, just before he was stoned. And so I'm going to begin reading in Acts 7, uh, verse 20. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful to God. He was nurtured for three months in his father's home. And after he had been put outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own da- as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was proficient in speaking and action. And when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered into his mind to visit his countrymen, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended and took vengeance for the oppressed man by fatally striking the Egyptian. Suppose... I think I'm missing something here, but anyway, suppose he was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting each other. And he tried to reconcile them to peace by saying, men, you are brothers. Why are you injuring each other? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away saying, who made you ruler and judge over us? You do not intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became a stranger in the land of Midian, where he fathered two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he was astonished at the sight, and as he approached to look more closely, the voice of the Lord came. 
I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and did not look closely. But the Lord said to him, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to rescue them. Now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you ruler and judge? is the one whom God sent to be both ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt. The reason I like this is because Stephen divides Moses' life into three equals 40-year periods. So in his first 40 years... We read both the beginning and the end. At that time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful to God. There's a little marginal note that says, well, pleasing to God. We're not really sure what this means, but I know it means this. His parents knew that God had a plan for Moses when he was born. There was something special about this child, and he was their third child. They just knew it. Somehow, God had revealed to Moses' mother, perhaps both of them, that the Lord has his hand on this child. At the end of his 40 years, we read that he was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Which is interesting because he tells the Lord 40 years later, I'm not a speaker. (laughs) now the second 40 years Stephen says he fled to Midian where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons and then his final 40 years he says that he led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and sights in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness Now, as we take these 40-year periods, he describes Moses' state and the perfecting work of the Lord Jesus in Moses' heart. In all three of these phases, the first 40 years, the Lord placed in Moses' heart the want to of faith. Moses wanted what God had for him. And we read that he was considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. We'll look at that in a second. Forty years later, the Lord places into Moses' heart, the how-to of faith. See, in 40 years he had the want to, but he had no idea how. And God waited 40 years to give Moses the how-to. So when he combined the want to and the how-to, that yielded the fruit of faith, which was his final 40 years. In his final 40 years, I just picked one example. So the Lord used to speak, used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. That is the fruit of holiness right there. It's an unbelievable statement. So, the first 40 years, at the end of that 40-year period, the Lord placed into Moses the want to of faith. It took 40 more years before Moses was ready to receive the how-to of faith. And then his final 40 years, 
He was yielding the fruit of faith. Let's take a look at this want to of faith. It says, whoops, (laughs) is this working? Okay. I always wanted to pretend to be Bon Jovi, so it's the the want to of faith. (laughs) By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. This is one of the greatest surrenders in the Bible. This is extraordinary. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He had claim to the, anything he wanted. And he refused it. And it says that he considered disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than all the treasures of Egypt. This is extraordinary. I can't really think of any other human Surrender that would equal this. Came close to this morning with Abram's surrender of all the wealth in Sodom, but this is like 10 times greater than that. It's extraordinary. Where did this come from? Well, Stephen mentions that it entered into his mind. What does that mean? And I think what it means is that the Lord Jesus revealed himself to Moses at 40. And that revelation was so amazing that he saw the beauty of the Lord Jesus that all the treasures of Egypt paled. That's great. Thank you for that word. (laughs) And he gave it all up. And he had his, and it illustrates this tremendous desire that the Lord placed in the Moses heart that he wanted what his God wanted for him. And he knew at that point that God wanted to use him as the human instrument to set his people free. And he took it And he ran with it. He ran all the way to Arabia with it. (laughs) It didn't quite work out. Because that's all he had was the want to of faith. He had no idea how to. And so, the how to of faith. Verse 30. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take take the sandals off your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans. And I have come down to rescue them. Come now and I will send you to Egypt. So the Lord appeared to him in a burning thorn bush. And then it caught Moses' attention. And the Lord waited until Moses came over. And then he begins to approach him. I mean to deal with him. But he waited until Moses approached to look more closely. And what exactly did he see? Well, he tells us 40 years later, this is the last word from Moses to the children of Israel before he, they cross in, over the uh, Jordan. This is when he's blessing the tribe of Joseph. And he says, with the choice things of the earth in his fullness and the favor of him who dwelt in the bush. 
let it come on the head of Joseph. This is 40 years after the, vis- after the burning bush. He's recalling it. And what he recalls about that is that is the him, which was Yahweh, who dwelt in the bush. So actually in this vision, or in this account, if you go to Exodus 3, which uh, we won't go to, but there are two revelations to God, of God to Moses in this event. The first is the name Yahweh, and then the second revelation is the sight of Yahweh in the burning bush. So let's just look at the name Yahweh first. This is where the name Yahweh is introduced to Moses when he says, what, what am I supposed to call you? Who, who are you? Which, which, what name do you want? And so God gives him the name Yahweh. Now this was a name that the Lord had really reserved for this moment. We read in Exodus 6, God also said to Moses, I am the Lord, that's I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, that's, that's El Shaddai. But by my name Yahweh, I did not make myself fully known to them. He was saving the revelation of Yahweh from Moses. He didn't, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't know him as Yahweh. They knew him as El Shaddai, which incidentally is a wonderful name. It actually means um, my nursing breast is God Almighty. That's what El Shaddai means, which is an incredible, incredibly intimate name that God gave to Abraham. Um. But he didn't reveal himself as Yahweh until Moses. So there's some significance to that. Now, what does the name Yahweh mean? First off, it's just four consonants. There's no vowels in the name, which is why the Jewish people will not ever pronounce this name because we, we're adding vowels in to make it articulable, but the Jews won't do that because they're, they don't know what the vowel should be, so they, they just don't say it at all. And they get offended if you mention it in their presence, which I learned the hard way. (laughs) Um, But there does seem to be some agreement on the meaning of these four consonants, uh, letters. So, and it's this. Yahweh refers to the eternal existence of God. The best definition of Yahweh that I've ever seen is in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, where the Lord Jesus says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the one who was, who is, and is to come, the Almighty. That's Yahweh. That's what it means. But there is a second revelation of Yahweh to Moses, and that's Yahweh in the bush. So Moses saw Yahweh dwelling in the bush. It says in verse 2, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. And then the Lord says, Do not come any closer Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. So he sees Yahweh dwelling in the bush. And Yahweh tells him this is holy ground, which tells us and told Moses that Yahweh is not only eternal, but he's transcendent. He's outside of his creation. And when the one outside of his creation comes into his creation, that ground is holy. So that's what he saw. And that's what he heard. The eternal God, the creator of the universe, is now dwelling in a burning thorn bush. What was that flame? 
Well, this is the beginning of the book of Exodus. And the book of Exodus presents the Lord Jesus to us as a complete Savior. And what, by that, what I mean is the book of Exodus illustrates how the Lord delivered His people from bondage and darkness. But not only that. He delivered them from two. That's a complete salvation. And He delivered them from bondage and darkness to freedom and light. And that's a complete Savior. And the best illustration of that in the book of Exodus is probably the tabernacle, but the second best is the burning bush. This is an illustration of complete salvation. What was this flame? Well, there is a word that the Hebrews came up with to describe the dwelling presence of God in the book of Exodus. And it was called the Shekinah glory. That's what this flame was. Shekinah is not found in the Bible. It was a word that the Jews came to describe the dwelling presence of God. So there was a Shekinah glory cloud by day. And there was a Shekinah glory fire by night. And that was an illustration that God was dwelling in their midst. Wherever the Shekinah glory was, the Lord was there. This is the first example of that. This fire is the Shekinah glory of the dwelling presence of God. So that's what he saw. He saw the dwelling presence and glory of God. And God chose a random thorn bush to illustrate his dwelling presence. But this thorn bush has significance. And I'm sure that Moses got it. You know what the thorn bush was? It's Moses. Let me explain this. You're with me? Good. You're the only one. (laughs) Well, hopefully I'll have more when I get done. (laughs) So, not only did Moses see the glory of God dwelling in a fruitless thorn bush, he also saw himself in the fruitless thorn bush. We read in verse 30, After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. Uh, now, a thorn bush, you can look up in any dictionary. It doesn't have to be a Bible dictionary. And they will define thorn this way. A modified or aborted branch in the form of a sharp woody structure. A thorn in any botany dictionary will define it that way. It's an aborted branch. So when you see a thorn, that should have been a branch bearing fruit. But it's aborted. And now it's just a thorn. So instead of being a fruitful branch, it's a prickly, painful thorn. That's a condition of the fall. That's the whole purpose of it. What should be fruitful is now a thorn. We also read that he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. Now, the Horeb just means a dry, arid, desolate place. So what I want to suggest to you is this is a picture 
of God's full salvation. And Moses is the bush. At 80 years old, Moses has been in a very dry, arid place, yielding only thorns. He has yet to produce any fruit at all. Even though at 40, he gave up everything. And all he has produced to this point in his life is thorns. He has a broken marriage, a criminal charge. He's living with his pagan priest, father-in-law. And that's Moses at 80. He is the thorn bush. But Yahweh has chosen to dwell in that bush. That's full salvation. We read in the book of Genesis that after the fall, it will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. This is just the condition of fallen man. This isn't exclusive to Moses. This is our natural state. Spiritually, our natural state is just dry, arid, lifeless, fruitless existences. But Moses also saw something else. And what he saw was the glory of the Lord radiating out of that bush without using one cell of the life of the bush to radiate his glory. That's full salvation. That's what it is. God will dwell in us. And brother, he will radiate his glory in us. But he's not going to use one cell of us to do it. This is the vision. It's exactly the same as John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit because apart from me, you can bear no fruit, only thorns. That's the whole meaning of the burning bush. Moses is the bush. We get a little picture of the reality of this years later, or actually just a year later. In Exodus 34, we read, As he came down from the mountain with two covenant tablets in his hand, Moses didn't realize that the skin of his face shone brightly because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw the skin of Moses' face shining brightly, they were afraid to come near him. Why was, his, why was his face shining brightly? It was the Shekinah glory. It was the Lord shining in Moses. That's exactly what the burning bush is. It's the same thing. This also happened in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, it says, Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed like tongues of fire that separated it and came to rest on each of them. What were those tongues of fire? It's the Shekinah glory. Why was the Shekinah glory there? Because the Holy Spirit came and dwelt in them. It's all the same thing. So, let's take a second look at this 30, this three, 40 year period. At the end of 40 years, his first 40 years, we read Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. 
But Moses himself, he was unable to enter into God's calling for him because of his self-sufficiency. Because he was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. He was a very important guy. God had already revealed to him he was going to be God's instrument to set the people free. But he thought it was his own hands that were going to do it. And because of who he was. He was an important guy, at least in his own mind, <laughs> like everybody else. <laughs> well, 40 years later, what happens? Moses says to God, when God says, I'm sending you to set the people free, what does Moses say? Please send somebody else. <laughs> So now he's unable to enter into it, not because of self-sufficiency, but because of a lack of self-confidence. Well, both are unbelief. So how did God deal with this? And I know God dealt with it because we read in Numbers 12, now, Moses was a very humble man, more, than, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. It's interesting that he wrote that. <laughs> but anyway, we have a wrong, I think most of us have a wrong conception of what humility is. Humility is not thinking low thoughts of yourself. Humility is thinking no thoughts of yourself. And that's where Moses was. That's what he's talking about when he says he's, he's the most humble man. He never thought of himself because it wasn't him. It was Yahweh in him. And that was his final 40 years. That's how he lived. And that's how he became fruitful. And as we saw the fruit of holiness, that he would speak to God face to face as like two friends. Because it was no longer about Moses. It was about Yahweh in Moses. And Yahweh was going to radiate his glory in Moses, but he wasn't going to use one cell of the life of Moses to do it. That's the Christian life. That's full salvation. That's the message of the book of Exodus. So, how did God transform Moses from extreme self confidence to extreme lack of confidence to God confidence? The burning bush. It was the vision of the burning bush. Because what he was showing Moses is, Moses, I have chosen you and I want to dwell in you. Almighty God. And I want to radiate my glory in you. And that transformed Moses. Because now he became, his confidence wasn't in himself. And his lack of confidence didn't matter. He was God confident. And that's why he was faithful in all the house of Israel. This is something that the Lord Jesus built into him. This is the author and perfecter of faith. And this is how he was perfecting Moses' faith. It was a revelation. It was a revelation at 40 when it entered into his mind that he was going to be God's human instrument. That was the want to, but he had no idea how to. And it took a second revelation where God showed him the how to. It's not your hand. It's my hand in you. And Moses' final 40 years He wasn't producing thorns. He was producing fruit. A man by the name of Ian Thomas wrote a book, The Saving Life of Christ. I think it was chapter 8, but I'm not really sure. But anyway, the title was, Any Bush Will Do. (laughs) And uh, it's all about the Lord Jesus within the bush 
that doesn't use one cell of the life of the bush to radiate his life, his power, and his glory. Through the bush to a barren world. It's interesting that Horeb was filled with these thorn bushes. And the Lord just picked that one. And that's just a picture of humanity. We're born into spiritually a very dry, arid, fruitless place. And the Lord just picks a random thorn bush. There's plenty of random thorn bushes right here that he chose. And he's dwelling in us. And he's going to radiate his glory in us. And the wonder of it is, any bush will do. (laughs) What's that? Hallelujah. You got it, brother. (laughs) <laughs> let me just give you one more illustration of this it's glorious truth in the life of Moses and it has to do with the hand in Acts 7 we read this and he Moses supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him but they did not understand but through him there's a marginal note and it says it's literally his hand So this is Moses at 40. He supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through his hand, but they did not understand. So when Moses attacked the taskmaster, in his mind he was thinking that the 2.5 million Jews that are enslaved right now, they're going to rise up with me and we're marching out of here. Well, that didn't happen. But he thought it was his hands. In Exodus 3, at the burning bush, God says, I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. This is not about you, Moses. It's about me. And it's my hand. It's not your hand. In Exodus 14... God tells Moses, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into a dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. This was the great victory. And the children of Israel were looking at their former taskmasters. They were all dead. And they wrote this great song in Exodus 15. And this is what they wrote. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. Well, it appeared to be Moses' hand. But in the song, they said it was the Lord's hand. Well, it was the Lord's hand, and it was Moses' hand. It was the Lord's hand in Moses' hand. That is how Moses lived his final 40 years. And that's what God showed him at 80 in the burning bush. That he is going to radiate his glory. In Moses, an 80 year old thorn bush. In his final 40 years, he would enjoy the fruits of holiness. This is the author and perfecter of faith. So we read about his victorious second exit from Egypt. His first was not so victorious. (laughs) But his second, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. That's combining the want to with the how to. Voila.
<laughs> I love this. This is our God. And this is our salvation. And a part of the wonder of his redemptive work is that he is responsible for our faith. It's not us. And he who began a good work will complete it. I said this morning it took uh, 80 years before Abraham could produce fruit for God. Well, we're moving up. For Moses, it took 80 years. Now, why does it take so long? God just waits till we're ready. Moses wasn't ready at 75 to receive this vision. The minute he was ready, the Lord met him. But it took 80 years. But he will perfect us. All right, thank you. So anybody have any thoughts about this? Sure he is. I've had a lot of experiences in the last eight years that have taught me so much. Yeah, well, thank you. He's perfecting what he began in you. 28, 38, 68, 88. Doesn't matter. Joe, I want to mention, I just a few minutes ago talked about how important you know, God works through us as sets us up as husbands. But i got to say, I am a thorn bush of a husband. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't notice any disagreement there. <laughs> My guess is Ed might say, even though I pointed to Ed as a wonderful example, and he is, I am a thorn bush of a husband, and it's the, the flame of, the, of God yeah. through me. Yeah. That makes me functional as a husband. Yeah, well the flame the flame of God is the dwelling presence of God. That's what that is. That's the whole point of the book of Exodus, the kind of in the book of Exodus. It's the dwelling presence. And so what God was revealing to Moses, and Moses got it because forty years at the, his last speech he said, May the blessing of him who dwelt who dwelt in the bush, what's the blessing? He's dwelt in me for 40 years. That's what the blessing was. Go ahead. I'd like to make a comment. I once heard Stephen Kahn uh-huh. preaching on Moses. Really? And he related it to the only psalm Moses wrote. That's great. Uh, yeah. Psalm I, I, 80. I love this. And Stephen made the point that a man will live three score and ten if by reason of strength to eighty. Yeah. And he put eighty as his net the end of natural life. Yeah. And then he said Moses met God at the end of his natural life and began to Yeah. Live. So in case you didn't understand it, so Moses wrote one psalm. And in that one psalm that he wrote, some say he wrote another one, but we know he wrote at least one. It's psalm ninety or ninety one is ninety. He wrote one psalm. And in that psalm, it says, It has been appointed unto man to live 70 years, but in the event of strength, 80. Well, Moses lived 120. Well, no, he didn't. He really did die at 80. The old Moses died at 80. And the remaining 40 years was the Lord Jesus in him. Thanks for for that. I, I appreciate that. I meant to mention that, actually. <laughs> the good thing is we don't have to wait till 80. Okay, well, we'll, we'll and what, so, um, when can we start? <laughs> we can start when we're ready. But we don't know when we're ready.
Uh, the Lord had His hand on Moses at birth. And the parents saw that. They knew it. And Moses knew it because he was raised by his mother and sister, at least in the early years. And I'm sure they told him, there's something special about you. <laughs> God has his hand on you. And God did have his hand on him. And it's just amazing to me. I, I, you know, it just took so long. And it wasn't God's. God wasn't delaying because he wanted to delay. God was delaying until Moses was ready to receive what he had for him. And that's what he's doing with you, and that's what he's doing with me. Anybody else? Is 40 the new 80? <laughs> I don't know. You have to tell me. <laughs> I think it's when we realize that Christ in me is the hope of the world. When we come to that realization, uh, He is able to to work in me, to live in me, to produce fruit in me. Until we come to that realization, it's our flesh that's making all the efforts, and it's and 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 producing what we. Amen, brother. What what can we produce apart from him? Thorns. And they hurt. Were you powerful in word and speech? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing the verse you share. What's our hope? Our hope of glory is Christ in us. And that's full salvation. This is the same thing. This is the spirit and power. You know, it's entering into all that Christ's redemption holds for us. And we enter into it by faith. Praise God, He's the author and perfecter of that faith. It's not on us. You know, I think, I think Moses can probably look back over that 40 years in the wilderness and, and see how God was teaching him all the way through that. See the lessons that he followed as he tended those sheep, as he raised that family, as, as, uh, and, and then he had that yep. I think what God taught Moses in those 40 years, the middle 40, 
was the first 40, he thought he was a big shot. He's powerful in word and speech. The next 40, he took all that away. And he taught Moses, you know what, Moses? The only thing you can produce is thorns. You got a broken marriage. You know, I mean, it's all bad. And Moses, I'm, I mean, this is my imagination, but I'm sure he was hating life in that 40 years. Nothing good came out of that, except it prepared him for the burning bush. And, and that's what I meant. That's what I meant. That's yeah. What He became ready to receive what God had for him. Yeah, I, I think that's right. All right, thank you. Thank you. Sure.